Two years after Crystal, the third generation of Pokemon arrived with Ruby and Sapphire. Today, we'll be covering the definitive version of this generation, Emerald, and we'll discover why this generation has come to be one of the most beloved and at the same time most derided. As a quick reminder, this is the third video in an ongoing series of videos analyzing the Pokemon series. If a concept has been explored before, it will not come up again unless something about it has changed. Before we begin, I'll explain a major under the hood change since I'm not sure where else it would fit in nicely. Generation 3 marks a shift in how the games process Pokemon data and all of the various statistics that come with it. Instead of basing things like gender, shininess, and form off of Pokemon's DVs, all of these are based on a new value called the personality value. All hidden from the player, but in combination with the DV system being replaced with IVs, which go from 0 to 31 instead of 0 to 15 and are individualized for all stats, and stat experience being replaced with EVs, which have a hard limit and cannot completely maximize each stat, there's a possibility for much greater variety within individual Pokémon than there ever was before. Why does this matter to the average player? Besides adding more variety through a larger pool of random elements and affecting two specific things in the game, this new system results in a fundamental incompatibility with Generation 1 and 2. Connecting a Game Boy Advance to a Game Boy or Game Boy Color game was impossible due to the way the link cable for each system worked so Game Freak decided this was the right time to overhaul the system. In hindsight, this was a great move, since this is how Pokemon data is stored to this day and it allows for variables to be added or changed as necessary. But at the time, the inability to trade from the old games was a wildly unpopular move. Things have settled on this front as time has moved forward, and every one of the 386 Pokemon are still programmed into the game, so nothing is completely missing. It's difficult to obtain every Pokemon though, since this generation spread out various Pokemon in such a way that you're required to have access to at least 5 of the 7 games this generation in order to complete your Pokedex. This mistake has not been repeated since, thankfully. As with the previous games, Pokemon Emerald features a new region, Hoenn this time, with new Pokemon and for the first time a new regional Pokedex, which will become a staple from here on out. There's 135 new Pokemon, and most of them are great additions. This is the first game where you're unable to name your rival, but also the first game where your player's gender has an impact, as the opposite gender player character becomes your rival. The impact of this is relatively minor. Your rival's personality will be a bit different, but their goals are the same and they appear at the same points in the story, with the only difference being what they say to you. The game properly starts in the back of a moving van, as most great adventures do. The Pokémon do all the work for us, though, a neat way to further highlight the codependence between people and Pokémon. The only thing we have to do is set the clock, though the time system definitely takes a back seat in this game. It only powers a handful of things in the game, unlike in Crystal, and Pokémon spawns aren't determined by time at all. The overworld always appears bright and sunny even if it's the dead of night, so this might be the last time you regularly see the world in these videos looking bright like this. We're told to meet Professor Birch next door, but instead end up meeting our rival. May if you're male, and Brendan if you're female. Professor Birch is in the route up ahead, and we find him being chased by a Zigzagoon. We're given the choice between Trico, Torchic, and Mudkip, some of the best starters in the series. Every single one of them is great, and Torchic and Mudkip evolve into fantastic duel types, fire fighting and water ground respectively. There's an overabundance of water types in Hoenn, but I'm going with Mudkip since Swampert is one of the best Pokemon in the game and it's my favorite starter in the series. Things play out in a familiar way from here. Travel to the next town, defeat your rival, return home, get the Pokedex. Around this time, you'll probably have checked the status screen and noticed two new things, abilities and natures. Natures alter your strategy a bit. A serious nature like my Mudkip doesn't affect anything, but a timid nature like my Ralts affects its stat growth. Its speed will be 10% higher and attack will be 10% lower. And there's a combination like this for every stat except for HP. This is essentially hidden from the player until a much later game, and a casual player is free to ignore it, but knowing about it can help you plan your strategies better in terms of what your Pokémon's natural strengths and weaknesses are. Abilities, though, are much more readily apparent in function, and you'll be seeing a lot of unique ones as we go throughout the series. They can be as simple as the starter Pokémon's ones that boost same-type attack moves when they're low on health, 
or as complex as, well, we'll save that for when we come across it. You'll notice a few kinds of new Pokemon that have become a standard the rest of the series follows up. A new regional rodent, new regional bird, and new regional bug that are essentially training wheels you'll grow out of as the game progresses. Though it's definitely possible to use them throughout if you want to. Speaking of, Wormpole is an interesting case. It can evolve into one of two Pokemon, and despite rumors to the contrary, it's essentially random because it's determined by its personality value right away demonstrating one of the benefits of the new system. Incidentally, you might hear Pokemon cries in the overworld if you're in a route long enough. These are a nice touch adding a bit of life to the world and letting you know what kind of wild Pokemon are nearby. When we leave town, Mom gives us the running shoes. These let us run in the overworld, and now's a good time to mention that these games are blazing fast compared to the older games. They're the first in the series to run at a constant 60 FPS, and between the running shoes and the general speed of the game, Emerald runs at an incredibly fast pace. On the next route, you'll see the first berry patch. Berries have been overhauled significantly. There's a lot more berries to choose from with varying effects and purposes, but more importantly, you're the one planting them this time. They're one of the few things affected by the clock in that it takes real life days for them to grow. But being able to dictate what berries are growing where and being able to grow more of the ones you do want and completely ignore the ones you don't is a much better system. Pretty soon we arrive in Petalburg and, oh yeah, the box system got a complete overhaul too. No more switching boxes and worrying about running out of space. It's all instantaneous with a great UI showing you exactly what Pokemon is where in any box. It goes without saying that the game overall has benefited greatly from the hardware leap as it's the best looking and sounding game so far without question. Anyway, we can try to move on, but this helpful individual will force us to go to the gym and meet Norman, our dad. The first, and so far only, time the player character's father is present in the game. A kid named Wally walks in and asks for help getting his first Pokemon. In a clever move, the game disguises as catching tutorial here by having you help Wally catch his first Pokemon. It's a great way to not patronize longtime fans. It took me a while to catch on to the fact that this was a tutorial for the player at all. After Wally catches a Ralt successfully, he bids us farewell and our dad tells us we aren't strong enough to face him yet, and that we'll need to collect other gym badges first. The first one is in Rustboro City close by, so that's our next destination. To get there, we have to go through Petalburg Woods. Like Viridian Forest and Ilex Forest, this isn't difficult by any stretch. It's just a winding trail with a few trainers in between. This is the first time we meet Team Aqua, one of this game's villainous teams, and protect this Devon employee. Like most grunts, he doesn't pose much of a threat. At the end of the woods, you'll spot some cuttable trees. We can come back here for some extra stuff once we can use cut. Exiting the woods, there's some hidden items in this alcove and the flower shop, where we can get the Whalmer Pail for more efficient berry management. On the bridge up ahead, you might or might not be stopped by the twins here. This is the introduction of Double Battles, a battle format that requires at least two Pokémon from each side. Double Battles are fairly uncommon during the main storyline, but have become the standard for official competitive matches, and for good reason. They're more complex than a one-on-one -on -one match because of the number of Pokémon involved and special moves and strategies that only exist in doubles matches. Still, being their introduction, they have a long way to go from here. Some moves like Surf only hit your opponents, while Earthquake hits every Pokémon on the field, despite being similar in power. And as soon as a Pokémon is knocked out, it gets replaced, meaning the replacement might get knocked out immediately afterwards without getting to do anything. After that, we arrive at Rustboro, which is home to the trainer school and the first gym. There's also the Cutmaster, who gives you the HM for Cut, and this new dad who needs us to tell him something funny to get his daughter to smile. Well, I'm out of ideas. North of town is mostly a dead end with a small beach, and east of town eventually hits a dead end inside the tunnel, so I'm going to catch an Inkeda before we head to the gym. The first gym this time around is a rock-type gym again, and follows the typical convention of having a long way around all the trainers inside, making the fights optional. If you do decide to fight them, this is where we find our first multi-battle. They're essentially just double battles, but should enlighten you to the possibility of having a double battle where you're teamed up with a friend. At the end of the gym is Roxanne, the first gym leader, and despite using rock types, I doubt many Torchic players will struggle here unless they're underleveled, since Combuskin learns a fighting type move. 
and even then there's plenty of water or grass types on your way here. For our efforts, we get the stone badge, and immediately upon exiting the gym we see another aqua grunt run off and that same Devon employee attempting to give chase. He's gone into Rust Turf Tunnel and taken Mr. Briny's Pokemon as a hostage. Fortunately for us, he's no tougher than the last grunt we fought, so the Goods and Pico are back with us in no time flat. Mr. Briny thanks us for rescuing his Pokemon, and the Devon employee brings us to meet the president of the Devon Corporation. We are asked to deliver the Devon goods to Slateport City, and to deliver a letter to a man in Duford named Steven, and are given a Pokenav as thanks. The Pokenav is essentially the new Pokegear, minus the radio, allowing us to call and rematch trainers we meet along our journey. This time it has infinite space for numbers, so if you're so inclined you can go around asking trainers you've battled so far to register, and even Mom and Professor Birch will add you if you're willing to go that far. Mayor Brendan will also add you and challenge you to a battle. Strangely, this is optional, but with only a Wingle in their starter, they aren't much of a challenge at this point. With all of that taken care of, it's time to ask Mr. Briny a favor and head over to the island town of Duford. Duford is a very small town, but we won't find Steven anywhere in town. He's in Granite Cave on the outskirts of town, which you're meant to traverse with Flash. Since Flash is optional though, you can get through the cave fairly easily. The optional part of the cave is blocked by a steep sand dune, and find him that way instead, completely skipping the gym here. We'll have to come back eventually, but it's pretty cool that we can even do this at all. Steven gives us a TM for our troubles and gets registered in the Pokenav before going on his way. If you decide to give Mr. Stone a call, he'll tell you he has a reward for delivering the letter, and if you go back and get it, it turns out to be an experience share, probably worthwhile if you're training multiple Pokemon. Now's as good a time as any to mention that Pokeball types are displayed on the status screen too. This is neat for aesthetic purposes and lets you prove to your friends that you actually worked for that legendary instead of just masterballing it. The only other things to do in Duford are pick up the old rod and tell this guy what's trendy. This introduces the easy chat system, which I assume was created so you can't send swears to your friends anymore. Still, with a little bit of creative thought, you can come up with ridiculous things for this guy and everyone in the building to repeat back to you. How about the trend among every other protagonist in the series? There we go. I hope these people enjoy taking a cultural issue hilariously lightly. With that out of the way, it's off to Slateport. In Slateport City proper, there's the Marketplace, where you can buy vitamins and Poké Dolls that serve as decorations for something later on. There's also the region's Name Raider and Pokémon Fan Club, and there's a huge line of Aqua Grunts trying to get into the museum. If we head out of the city, they're blocking the path there too, and we can't go the other way since we don't have a bike yet. There's also a battle tent. A preview for a post-game area we'll get into more detail on later, but if you beat three trainers in a row here you get a small reward. If we visit the shipyard in search of Captain Stern, we learn he's at the museum. It costs 50 Poké Dollars to get in, but if you're particularly cheap or terrible at finances, you can go in with less money and be let in anyway. There are a load of Aqua Grunts in here, as expected, including the guy we thrashed earlier in Rust Turf Tunnel, who gives us a TM... oh wow, that's rich, buddy. If you want, you can read the signs in the exhibits here and learn real-life information about the sea. That's a pretty great touch. I'm sure at least one person out there got interested in thalassic studies as a result of this. Captain Stern is on the second floor, and delivering the ship part triggers two Aqua Grunts to storm in and challenge us. They shouldn't be too difficult overall, but they both use a Carvana, which has the ability Rough Skin, damaging you when you use attacks that make physical contact. Though annoying, they'll be down in short order, and we meet their leader, Archie, who warns us to stay out of their way. Goods delivered and roadblocks cleared, we can head north to our next destination. The two trainers who challenge you to a multi-battle right at the start use another standard new Pokemon type, Pikachu clones. These ones, plus Lunminen, have abilities that power each other up in double battles, making them some of the more unique Pika clones out there. Unfortunately, being a Pika clone means they're about as strong as the mascot itself, which is to say, they aren't. At the fork, we can go left to access the rest of Route 103, which has a few more trainer battles and some more berries. The house in the middle of the route is the Trick House, a really unique, puzzle-focused area that changes as you progress through the game. You can come back every time you get a new badge for a different puzzle and different prize. The first one is a small maze filled with cut trees that establishes the basic formula. Find the scroll, open the door in the back of the room. Getting to the end rewards us with a rare candy as the Trick Master teleports away, vowing to create tougher puzzles. 
With that weirdness out of the way, we're headed for our first roadblock, the third rival encounter in the game and one of the most difficult ones. They're carrying a water, grass, and fire type no matter what starter you chose, meaning they have options to deal with just about everything you can catch up to this point in the game. If you chose Mugcap and have evolved it by now, Grovile will be your worst nightmare. It's faster than you, deals quadruple damage with Absorb, and restores its health in the process. Combined with the fact that they're the highest level trainer we've encountered so far and yearn for a very rough fight, even compared to Silver's second fight in Crystal. When you defeat them, they'll give you the item finder, which is... better than it used to be? It's still less of a waste of time to search manually. After getting through the rest of the path, we're in Mauville City, home to this region's game corner and the next gym. There's a bicycle shop in the upper right, and the owner will give you a free bike for traveling such a long way to get here. He'll either give you a mock bike, which is extremely fast but hard to control, or an acro bike, which is slower but still faster than running and lets you do hops. You can switch any time, but what bike you choose determines what obstacles you can conquer. Having a bike lets you go on cycling road, and there's a small minigame here that challenges you to go from Mauville to Slateport on the mock bike without hitting obstacles. You don't get anything out of it but your own sense of satisfaction, though. The NPCs in the Pokemon Center talk about record mixing, a new feature that affects parity of events in games with friends you mix records with, as well as another feature we'll come across shortly. Oh, and the game corner has a roulette table now, so that's cool. Before we tackle the gym, let's explore a bit. There's not much to do to the east, but wish we had access to surf. To the west is this region's daycare in Verdant Turf Town, which houses another battle tent and the other entrance to Rust Roof Tunnel. It's around this time my Ninkata evolved into Ninjask, but unique to Ninkata is the fact that it evolves into two Pokemon at once, leaving a Shedinja behind if you have a spot open in your party. Shedinja is one of the best Pokemon to demonstrate how unique abilities can change the game. It has only one HP and can never have more than this, but to compensate it has the ability Wonder Guard. Only super effective moves can hurt it. Granted, there are quite a few. Flying, Rock, Fire, Ghost, and Dark type attacks can hurt it, it can still be poisoned, and certain weather effects also knock it out, but it can hold its own against a lot of Pokémon as a result of this unique ability. Verdant Turf is also the first time we see new Pokéballs. The ones in this game are mostly meant to be more reliable replacements to Kurt's Apricorn Balls from Gen 2. If we go north of Mauville, we'll see those are roadblocks by Rock Smash. There's also Trainer Hill. We can't do this yet, but we can come back here during the post-game. The Winstray family lives here too, and like the name implies, you have to win consecutive battles with the family. It's kind of a rough gauntlet since there's absolutely no breaks in between, and the reward is less than useful for the average player. The Macho Brace affects the EV game. While an important item for competitive play and not impossible to use casually, it's difficult to use and most people are better off not using it. We've explored all we can so far, so now it's time to tackle the next gym, but not before we take on Wally and show him he's not as ready as he thinks he is. The next gym is an electric gym with a fairly straightforward switch gate puzzle. Your starter is likely all you need to face this gym. Grovile resists electric moves, Marsh Stomp is outright immune to them, and Combuskin's fighting moves tear through most of the gym with ease. Soon enough, you'll get the Dynamo Badge and can use Rock Smash, letting us get the HM for Strength, connect Rust Roof Tunnel together, and progress further up Route 111. Soon after the breakable rocks, we can see the desert, which has a massive sandstorm blowing through it, the first instance of weather in the overworld and far from the last. Heading west, we get to the base of Mount Chimney and see two Team Magma Grunts blocking the way up to the cable car that takes us up the mountain, so we have to take a detour through Fiery Path. It's literally a hallway with a small fork we can come back to when we can use strength, but true to its name, it does indeed have fire Pokemon in it. A bit past it, we can see the desert to the south, and if we head north a bit and talk to the guy next to this tree, he gives us secret power. Like Headbutt in the last game, this is a regular TM move turned field move that lets us open up hidden areas and trees and indents in the walls to create our own secret base. Secret bases are a cool concept, but they're not very important to gameplay unless you mix records with friends, in which case your friend's bases will start to appear in your game, and you can battle an NPC with their team once a day. Bases come in all shapes and sizes, some of them need extra items to be fully explored, and can be decorated as you see fit. This also leads to an example of the Mach Bike's ability to scale sand dunes once it picks up enough speed. 
Moving right along, the next route is extremely unique. It's covered in volcanic ash, which gets kicked up with every patch of grass you step in. The soot sack given to you by the glass blower later in the route can collect ash, which you can trade for flutes if you're dedicated enough to walk in the grass for a while. Right after that is Fall Arbor Town, a small community that has the basic amenities, another battle tent, and a new feature, the Move Reminder. For a hard scale, you can have a Pokemon remember any move it can learn by level up, making moveset choice significantly less of a gamble. Just outside of town is the Fossil Maniac's house, which will become more important during the post-game. But for now, we can pick up the TM for Dick here, which is noteworthy, but we'll see why later. The next route is fairly standard with some loosely hidden items here and there, and it brings us into Meteor Falls, which we can't fully explore until much later, and although it's possible to explore earlier, we won't be returning to it until near the end. Some magma grunts have stolen a meteorite from this guy, Professor Cosmo, and flee when Team Aqua makes an appearance, mentioning Mount Chimney. From here we can either go further in and end up just above Rustboro or go back the way we came, but our next destination is the cable car that was blocked off earlier. Atop Mount Chimney, Team Magma and Aqua are fighting it out, and it ends up being up to us to stop Team Magma from forcing the volcano to erupt. It's here we learn the ultimate goal of both teams. Magma wants to expand the landmass, and Aqua wants to expand the sea, and neither of them really think of the consequences of doing so. In many regards, they're incredibly similar. Their goals are similar, and the Pokémon they use are similar. Just switch Aqua's water types for Magma's fire types. As such, the Magma Grunts and even the Admin are easily dealt with, and Magma's boss, Maxi, isn't much different. After taking him down, Archie thanks us before retreating as well. The way to Lava Ridge Town is down Jagged Pass, one of the few areas where the Acrobike comes in handy, although why you would use the Acrobike to climb up instead of taking the cable car and going back down is beyond me. There's a Magma Grunt here looking totally inconspicuous, so assume this is another no-switch behind the poster situation and remember this spot for later on. Lava Ridge Town is tiny. It features a gym, hot springs, and a bitter medicine shop. This gym is a fire-type gym, filled with pits on the top floor and water spouts on the bottom floor, and it's up to you to navigate your way through to Flannery at the end. If you picked Mudkip, you essentially have a free win since you resist her attacks, although an unlucky critical overheat hits like a truck. If you didn't start with Mudkip, you'll probably have a solid water-type at this point to take care of business, but might find yourself stumbling due to her use of overheat on all of her Pokémon. For defeating Flannery, we get the Heat Badge and can use Strength in the Overworld, and upon exiting the gym, our rival gives us the Go Goggles, which will let us explore the Desert Armor 111. The only thing we can do with Strength at the moment is solve a few small Strength puzzles in Fiery Path for the Toxic TM and Firestone. We could go to the desert now, but first we have some gym leaders to take care of. Remember Brawly? At this point, we outlevel him badly, and any Pokémon you have should be able to get the job done. If you were to play the game normally and take him on, Woke Up would be your biggest obstacle, but he's not a huge threat regardless. With that, we get the Knuckle Badge and can use Flash outside of battle, for what that's worth. Now that we have four badges, we can finally challenge Norman. As the name suggests, it's a normal type gym, but it's a bit different than any other gym we've encountered so far. Instead of a traditional gym puzzle, this one is unique in that it gives you choices as to what kind of trainer you want to fight. The entrance being a choice between an opponent whose strategy relies on speed and an opponent who relies on attacks that can't miss, with other ideas pertaining to stat changes and other strategies for winning battles. This is incredibly unique and no other game in the series does something like this. It's a forceful way to show the player how much of a difference stat boosting moves can make in a series that rarely challenges the player in that way. Someone will probably argue that Sun and Moon did this as well, but we'll save that discussion for that video. However, the impact of the lesson is likely to vary greatly depending on what Pokémon you have. If you have an Aeron on your team, you might not learn anything because of its quadruple resistance to normal type attacks. Anything that doesn't resist normal might be in for a more difficult time here and learn the lesson as a result. And it can't be understated how important this lesson is if you plan on diving any deeper into the series as a PvP game. All of this leads up to a fight with your dad, and depending on your lineup and what the AI decides to do, this might be the hardest fight yet, or it might be the easiest. His ace is Slacking, a Pokémon with stats that rival high legendary Pokémon like Mewtwo or Lugia. The trade-off is that its ability is Truant. It can only attack every other turn, 
If it decides to hit you instead of just using counter and you don't resist it, you're in for a world of hurt. Even more if you decide to paralyze or poison it since it can hit you with a whopping 140 power facade. You can use the turns in between to your advantage though, be it to boost your own stats, heal yourself, or lower its stats. The rest of his Pokémon aren't exactly slouches, but if you can get through slacking, you can get through the rest with relative ease. With that, we get the Balance Badge and can use Surf outside of battle. Speaking of Surf, Wally's dad takes us back with him and gives us the HM for Surf out of gratitude for helping Wally out. With Surf, Hoenn expands drastically. We can use it in Petal Rook immediately for a few rewards for taking the time to explore, but I'm going to save the majority of our exploration until we get all the HMs in the game and can go anywhere we want. Be it through Meteor Falls, Route 103, or Rust Roof Tunnel, we'll make our way back to Mauville and explore a few of the areas that have opened up to us before we move forward. Watson is standing in the middle of town and asks us to shut down the generator in New Mauville. A small optional dungeon with some familiar electric types to catch and a few items scattered about, all underlined by a puzzle involving colored switches which open doors. Shutting down the generator and talking to Watson again gets us the TM for Thunderbolt. An extremely good move, as always. Since we didn't earlier, we should explore the desert, where we'll find a few new Pokémon and the Mirage Tower, which requires the Mach Bike to traverse due to the floor tiles that collapse as soon as you step on them. Once you reach the top, you'll find this game's fossils, which contain new fossil Pokémon. Whichever you don't pick will vanish into the sand after the tower collapses. There's also a strange rock formation in the south of the desert which will become important later on. Moving onward, we can now surf on Route 118 to get to our next destination. Steven chats with us again briefly about the nature of raising Pokémon before departing, and we find a fork where we can go north or west. Going to the west, we're stopped by ledges preventing us from going further in the route, but we can visit the Berry Master's house. He'll give you a few berries every day, and the field outside is a great place to plant multiple berries. To progress, we go north to Route 119, where we find very tall grass. Unfortunately, we can't bike nor run in the very tall grass, so we'll have to forego the bike for most of the route. There's a point here where you need the acro bike, but it only leads to some additional secret base locations. Honestly, the acro bike is barely worth keeping around unless you know you'll need it. The mock bike, being faster, is more convenient most of the time and areas where it's necessary seem to pop up far more often. Further up the route we reach the Weather Institute and the presence of Aqua Grants outside means they've stormed the facility in search of something. As usual, they're easy pickings. Even the admin you fight at the end. A grunt appears to report Team Magma's attempt to storm Mount Pyre and Team Aqua runs off. As thanks, we're given a cast form, which I'm not even going to bother giving screen time to. It's very weak and not worth using, even with its ability to switch its type with the weather. We can cross the bridge now, giving us access to the river. This leads to one of the most difficult to obtain Pokémon of the entire franchise, Feebas. Feebas can only be found on six tiles randomly decided upon creating your save file or changing the trend in Doofer. As such, finding one can be incredibly time-consuming. If you still need a water type though, Feebas is a worthwhile addition to your team. Its evolved form is incredibly strong. Heading north, our rival challenges us once again, and this is the final mandatory rival battle in the game. And they're pathetic. Only three Pokémon that aren't fully evolved? I'm not sure who thought this decision through, but it's baffling that the last time you're required to face your rival, they have a team you should be able to plow through with ease. After beating them, they'll give you the HM for Fly, which we can use if we beat the next gym. Fortree City is just up ahead, and it's one of the most unique concepts in the series. A city built almost entirely on treetops. It doesn't have much in terms of areas of interest, though. There's a shop with decorations for your secret base and the gym, which is blocked by an invisible thing. To get into the gym, we need to go a little way on Route 120 and talk to Steven, who demonstrates the Devon Scope. This isn't used very frequently, but it unmasks the invisible Pokémon Kecleon that block various paths around here. With that in hand, we can go back to the gym and unblock it, but before that we can unblock the path down to this lake where the scorched slab lies. It's an empty room with no Pokémon inside, just a TM for Sunny Day. It's a very weird location, but makes sense when you consider Hoenn's real-life equivalent in The Legend of Amaterasu. A nice touch, but it's bound to go over most Western players' heads. 
before it's reached GM is skippable until the end of the game, but it's much more convenient to have access to fly at this point. This gym's puzzle centers around hinged gates that turn on an axis one way but not the other, creating situations where you must fight a trainer to move a gate in a particular way to get through a different gate to make progress. At the end is Winona, whose team is mostly a pushover with the exception being her Altaria, a dragon flying type that will likely resist a lot of your attacks and is only weak to a few types you might not have. Beat her though and we get the feather badge and the ability to use fly, and we can move on to Route 120. Past the bridge it starts to rain and there are a bunch of trainers in the first area. The game is really starting to favor putting multi-battles in your way whenever it can, urging you to think about the first two Pokemon in your lineup constantly. It also gets you to think about how the weather in the overworld affects the battle. The rain here powers up water moves and makes Thunder 100% accurate. There's a small alcove hidden by a cuttable tree at the end that has a few more berry plants and another secret base location. The next section is a small maze made from very tall grass with some trainers hidden through the color of their clothing. And immediately following it is another bridge where the weather clears up and the technical capabilities of the Game Boy Advance shine through again, with clouds overhead being reflected in the water to create a very memorable scene. To the left is a small cliffside containing a small pond and some hidden items. And if you travel through the tall grass, you'll find another landmark identical to the one in the desert. To the east is Route 121, and upon approaching the pier, we briefly see Team Aqua heading off to Storm Mount Pyre. We could give chase, but before that, there's the Safari Zone, which we can't enter yet. We'll be back when we get that Pokeblock case, though. We get to Lily Cove City out of convenience so we can fly back later since we're turning around to climb Mount Pyre. Mount Pyre has two sections, an inner section that's a graveyard similar to Pokemon Tower, and an outer section that Team Aqua is currently storming. The inner section is optional, but has quite a few trainer battles and a few good items if you reach the top. The outer section also has a few items you could find if you look around and interact with gravestones. Does this make us grave robbers? At the very least, it's like going to a cemetery and stealing the offerings off random headstones. No time to think about that, though. Team Aqua needs stomping, and as per usual, they'll be tossed aside in no time flat. It's too late, though, as Archie has taken the red orb, and apparently Maxi was here and stole the blue orb. You would think they would realize the mix-up, but as usual, it falls on us to take back what they stole and hope nothing bad happens. Fun fact, Chima go live up here. This is the only place in the game where they appear, no trainers use one, and they have a ridiculously low encounter rate. The real kicker is that Chimico is bad, too. It's another Pokémon meant only for Pokédex completion and is one of the most frustrating ones in the series to find. We can return to Lily Cove, where we can also access the other side of Route 123 here, which has more trainers to battle and a few hidden rewards for coming back here. It's also necessary to go through at least twice if you want to battle everyone here and collect every item because of the ledges found throughout the route. Once that's done, we can head back to Lily Cove City and check out what it has to offer. Lily Cove is a large port town containing Hoenn's move deleter, a hotel, whatever this thing is, the Pokemon contest hall, and the department store. In the contest hall, we can get a free Pokeblock case and can now enter Pokemon contests. A side feature that's time intensive, so we'll cover it in the post game. In front of the department store is our rival, and this is the final time we encounter them. It's a shame their team at this point is laughable. It's likely any decently trained team will outlevel them by now, their starter hasn't even evolved, and their slugma hasn't either. The game almost hands you the victory, and if you don't need to go to the department store, you don't need to do this battle at all. Despite having one of the toughest battles in the franchise, Brendan and May are easily the worst rivals in the series. The department store, as usual, has great items in stock and has a lot of secret base decorations, so most players will find it worth their while to trance their rival one last time. Since we have the Pokeblock case now, we can enter the Safari Zone. The Safari game is the same as it was back in Kanto with the addition of Pokemon feeders throughout that can influence the nature of Pokemon you'll encounter in the area. Just like Gen 1, there's certain Pokemon you can only find here. This is another area with bike-specific paths, one for the Mach Bike and one for the Acro Bike, so you'll need to make two trips if you want to catch everything here. With that out of the way, we return to Lily Cove and try to move on, but find this Aqua Grunt training Whalmer and blocking the way out of the city. The Aqua Hideout is nearby, and the Grunts tell us to go to Mount Chimney. Remember the suspicious Magma Grunt in Jagged Pass? If we go back there, the pathway to the Magma Hideout reveals itself and we're on to the next mandatory dungeon. 
strangely, there are wild Pokemon here. And between them and the Magrungrunt stationed throughout, you'll be worn down by the time you reach the bottom. There's a bunch of items hidden throughout the base, making navigation feel rewarding despite being ambushed constantly if you don't have repels. At the bottom of the base, Maxi awakens Groudon, a legendary Pokemon with the blue orb. Enraged, Groudon leaves, and Maxi thinks we're to blame for this, despite the fact that he didn't think to awaken the red Pokemon with the red orb. That idiocy aside, Maxi is actually pretty tough. His levels are the highest we've seen so far, his Crobat is a huge nuisance, and if you're not prepared, his camera ups can catch you off guard and tear through your team. Unless, oddly enough, you have a grass type, since his camera up doesn't have any fire moves. Defeated, Maxi leaves in search of Groudon. Meanwhile, Team Aqua is hijacking Captain Stern's submarine back in Slateport City. We can finally give chase to the Aqua hideout, which has a few warp tile puzzles, including an optional one that leads to a room with the only Master Ball in the game. At the end of the base, we fight another Aqua Admin and watch as the submarine leaves. We can't chase them quite yet, but now we can travel east onto the ocean. Ah, the ocean. One of the most controversial parts of the Generation 3 games. The complaint that these games have too much water has been mocked relentlessly, but it has some truth to it. The ocean in Hoenn is vast, and there's not much visual variety to it. It's pretty easy to get lost out here, and if you didn't pack repels, you'll be running into wild Pokemon all the while. We'll be following the story path here for a while, and the first destination at sea is a straight shot to Moss Deep City. Moss Deep is home to a space center, which Team Magma sent a cordial letter to about their plans to attack it for rocket fuel. Sounds like a fun time, but before that we have a gym to conquer. This one is a psychic gym with a heavy emphasis on multi-battles. The switches you have to press to rotate around the trainers and statues almost always put a multi-battle in your way and there's quite a lot of them on the way to the switch that unblocks the path to the gym leader. There are two gym leaders this time, Tay and Liza, who fight you in a double battle with a fantastically coordinated team. They will be your toughest challenge so far. All of their Pokemon are immune to ground attacks, and they aren't afraid to use Earthquake as a result. Between Zatu's constant use of Calm Mind and Claydol's relentless earthquakes, the first set is difficult to get through. The second is just as difficult, using a strategy of setting up Sunny Day to get powered up flamethrowers and solar beams to cover a wide variety of Pokemon you probably have. I got through by the skin of my teeth and got the well-deserved mind badge for my efforts. Team Magma finally arrives and we witness them starting to storm the space center. After the gym, these guys are a joke in comparison. At the top we learn they're still trying to erupt Mount Chimney, this time with the rocket fuel, but we get to team up with Steven to stop them. Maxi and Tabitha aren't too difficult, but will put up a fair fight, and they appear to at least somewhat realize they're making a mistake and abandon their plans here. Steven thanks us and asks us to meet him at his home, where he gives us the HM for dive, which we'll need very shortly to give chase to Team Aqua. If we head south and dive into the first patch of deep water we come across, we'll eventually reach the seafloor cavern and find the stolen submarine. Seafloor Cavern is a bit of a maze, there's a small strength puzzle at the start that unfortunately requires Rock Smash as well. The number of HMs at this point is starting to become a pain to manage. Especially since of the HMs, the only one which is truly useful in battle at this point is Surf. As usual, the Aqua Grunts and Wild Pokemon only serve to wear you down for the confrontation at the bottom. There's a few more strength puzzles and a puzzle involving water currents. A wrong move spits you out at the beginning of the dungeon, but it's short and easy to remember what you've done before to get through to the deepest part of the cavern, where you encounter Kyogre, another legendary, and Archie. Like Maxi, Archie isn't terribly difficult, but puts up a fight with an almost identical team, with Camerops being replaced with Sharpedo. Sharpedo's strength might catch you off guard, but once you take it out, Archie's red orb starts shining on its own, Kyogre awakens, and it rushes off. Archie gets a report from outside about the torrential downpour being worse than they imagined, and Maxi shows up to scold him despite knowing full well he was part of the problem here. At the surface, we can see the weather phenomenon taking place. The weather alternates between a downpour and blistering heat. Steven arrives shortly after Archie and Maxi leave and tells us to head to Sutopolis City in the northwest. There appears to be no entrance from the outside, but there's an entrance underwater and when we surface, we witness Kyogre and Groudon clashing over territory. Technical limitations really hurt the impact of this scene since your sprite is of very similar size, but if you're a kid or remember what it was like to be one, you can let your imagination fill in the gaps here. 
Since Archie and Maxie are blocking the gym, we can't really ignore the situation and follow Steven to the Cave of Origin, where we meet Wallace. He asks us what other location is connected to the Weather Titans, and even if you haven't been paying attention, the Sky Pillar is one of the options available and indeed is where we can find the key to this. Sky Pillar is to the northeast of Pacific Log Town, the smallest town in the game and home to basically nothing but a Pokemon Center and my favorite joke in the series. Sky Pillar isn't much of a dungeon, it's a straight shot to the top where Rayquaza lies. Upon awakening, Rayquaza flies off and it's back to Sutopolis. Rayquaza arrives to calm the two and flies off like nothing happened. Archie and Maxie express remorse for what they've done and leave to return the orbs to Mount Pyre. Steven and Wallace congratulate us on doing basically nothing and we're given the HM for Waterfall, which we can use after finishing up the next gym. This is a water type gym and at this point you have plenty of options to deal with water types. The puzzle is straightforward. Step on an ice tile and it cracks, step on it again and it breaks, sending you down a floor. Step on every tile and the stairwell is defrosted. The trick becomes stepping on every tile in such a way that the last one is right under the stairs. If you're good enough, you don't have to fight anyone but the gym leader, Juan. Juan's team is mostly unremarkable, but he has a few surprises. Whiskash, which is part ground and therefore is immune to electric attacks. Celio, part ice and resists grass attacks. And his ace, Kingdra. Like in Crystal, Kingdra is the most difficult Pokemon in his lineup. It's at the highest level we've encountered so far and has an incredibly annoying moveset. It uses Double Team to boost its evasion, then rest to undo any damage you've done. The only Dragon types you can get at this point are both Quad Weak to Ice, and Kingdra is packing Ice Beam. It's a colossal pain to deal with, but once it's done we get the Rain Badge and can head off to the Pokemon League. But first, let's see what we can explore now that the whole region is open to us. We can revisit the Sky Pillar right now, and if we do we find it's littered with rocks and cracks in the floor, requiring the Mach Bike to traverse. This is probably the most mechanical skill-oriented challenge in the entire series. In order to get past the cracked tiles, you must write quickly and with precision to get it crossed successfully. The first floor with cracked tiles is relatively lenient and gives you a rest spot, but the second floor is much less so. Ride too far and you fell back down to the start of the floor, but undershoot and you'll get the same result. You have to get the timing just right in order to proceed back to the top, where you can battle Rayquaza, who's at an absolutely incredible level 70. You can use the Master Ball here for an easy capture, although it might be worth saving for a different Pokemon later. You can capture it normally, but the difference in power means you'll have a tough go at it unless you're particularly lucky. Due to the vast level difference, getting Rayquaza trivializes the end of the game, but it's a fantastic reward for overcoming a difficult challenge. If we go west from Pacific Log onto Route 132, we'll find that the route consists mostly of tides that shift you around along with some items and a number of trainer battles, eventually spitting you out at Slateport City and forcing you to return to Pacific Log for another shot. If you keep south, you'll eventually reach a dive spot, where you'll find writing on the wall. Surface here and you'll end up in the sealed chamber. There's tablets across the room that contain the braille alphabet and a message at the back of the room. This is one of the most well-hidden secrets in Pokemon, and from here there's several puzzles requiring you to read visual braille to decode and solve. The first one is at the back of the chamber and requires you to use Dig to open the way through. In the next chamber, there's a story about the Pokemon associated with the sealed chamber, and a message reading, first comes Wailord, last comes Relican. If you have the two in your party in that order, chambers open up throughout the region that each contain a short puzzle written in braille in one of the legendary titans. The chamber we saw in the desert contains Regirock, and the one of Route 120 contains Registeel, while one between Petalburg and Dufer contains Regice. All three of these are solid additions to your team, boasting fantastic defensive stats and great move pools and they're good rewards for a very cryptic series of puzzles not many will find out about in their first playthrough. It's a unique and memorable side quest, and nothing quite like it has been done since. Since we're nearby, we can finish up Granite Cave. You can do this once you get the mock bike and are rewarded with a few items after doing a small challenge with collapsing tiles. If we go north of Rustboro City and back towards Meteor Falls, we can go a bit further and find a few trainers to battle, some additional secret base locations, some berries and items, and the only place in the game you can catch Jigglypuff should you want one. With Waterfall, we can traverse more of Meteor Falls to find a few more items and the only place in the game where Bagon can be caught. 
Right outside in Route 114, there's another waterfall and a rare candy at the top. And Route 119 has another waterfall that leads to some items and secret base locations accessible only with the Acrobike. There's plenty of secrets to discover through dive spots all throughout Hoenn's Ocean, including various shards which can be traded for elemental stones. North of Moss Deep is Shoal Cave, one of the few things in the game that uses the in-game clock. At certain times, the tide is low, and others the tide is high, and what you can and can't explore changes depending on the tide. As usual, there's items throughout the cave that reward exploration during both tides, and this is the only place in the game you can encounter the ice types fail and snow rent in the wild. The only other place we haven't been yet is the abandoned ship, a small dungeon with lots of keys and locked doors that requires dive to fully traverse. It has a few useful items like the TM for Ice Beam and the only luxury ball in the game. A shame since it's my favorite Pokeball aesthetically. That covers everything we can do for right now, so our next destination is Evergrande City. It's on the very right side of the map and requires Waterfall to reach, and calling this a city is a huge stretch considering it's only a lone Pokemon Center. The only other attraction is Victory Road, and it's a welcome return to form. There are a few short strength puzzles in here, but the main challenge is navigation and the amount of trainer battles within. It's easy to get turned around here, and the trainers carry a variety of Pokemon to wear you down. As always, exploration is rewarded with great items around almost every corner. Right at the beginning, Wally suddenly appears to challenge us. It's been a while since we last saw him, and he's improved a lot since then. If you haven't been diligent, the level difference will see you struggling here. But if you've been keeping up, the only members of his team that are a threat are the Altaria he leads with in his Gardevoir. His Altaria, like Winona's, can be tricky to deal with, and his Gardevoir knows Calm Mind and Double Team, letting it boost its power and become harder to hit. Once you beat him, Wally relents and lets you go through the rest of the cave. I'm not sure why they decided to move Wally from the end of the dungeon to the beginning. He was much more of a challenge when you had to face him right at the end after the whole gauntlet. In due time, you'll make it through Victory Road and enter the Pokemon League, ready to get your badges checked and face the Elite Four. Starting off is Sydney, who specializes in Dark types. As is tradition at this point, he and the last Elite Four member are the toughest of the bunch and are the real Roblox to get past at this point. There aren't a lot of fighting or bug types in the game, so you're somewhat unlikely to have moves that can hit Sydney's Pokemon super effectively. Most of his team is dual types though, so if you have something to take care of grass and water types, you should do pretty well here. His lead, Mightyana, isn't very resilient, and the only other pure dark type on his team, Absol, has a high physical attack but a low special attack, making its same type moves inconsequential. After Sydney, Phoebe is next, a ghost type specialist. Another strange choice given the limited number of ghost types in Hoenn, but she's really not much more than a nuisance if you get past Sydney. The next member might be the most baffling choice for a type specialist in the entire franchise. Glacia specializes in ice types in a region with only two fully evolved non-legendary ice types, and one of these families is part water. As such, if you have an electric type, you basically get a free pass through this one. The last member, Drake, is certainly the hardest. He specializes in dragon types, and besides the weak Shellgon he sends out at the start, his whole team is quite dangerous. Although they're all weak to ice and dragon moves, all of them have stellar type coverage they're not afraid to use. Like Lance before him, Drake is very difficult to deal with and will knock out unprepared teams again and again. Unfortunately, Drake is the last real obstacle in your way. The champion is Wallace, and he specializes in water types. By this point, you most likely have a good grass or electric type that can tear through his team with ease. He has Pokemon meant to deal with these, like Wishcash and Ludicolo, but once they're out of the way, you essentially have a free win despite the level difference. His team also doesn't have an answer to Shedinja. If he fails to inflict a status ailment on it, Shedinja has free reign to tear through his entire team. If you can make it this far, you'll become the champion in no time, entering the Hall of Fame and watching the credits once again. As usual though, there's post-game to cover, so let's dive right in. If you check your trainer card, you'll see it now has a star. These are rewarded for accomplishing major feats such as finishing the game, completing the Pokedex, and mastering a side activity. Serving as a checklist of sorts, almost every game going forward will have them. Downstairs, Dad is home and gives us the SS ticket courtesy of Mr. Briny before heading off again. A news broadcast shows up on TV and we're asked what color the announcer said. This determines which of the two rowing Pokemon shows up in your save. Red for Latias, blue for Latios. 
Like always, these are great additions to any team, and you might want to have one of these for the challenges ahead. But they're just as much of a bane to catch as the legendary beasts were in Crystal. Professor Birch also upgrades your Pokedex to the National Pokedex, allowing us to completely catalog all 386 Pokémon available in Generation 3. This is also the first time completing a Pokedex yields a reward other than the Diploma. If you complete the Hoenn Pokedex, you can choose between one of the Johto starters, one of the only ways to get them in Gen 3. There's a handful of new places to explore around the region. If you go to the Weather Institute, you can find out what route is displaying unusual weather activity. Strong droughts lead to Terra Cave and the ability to catch Groudon, and strong storms lead to Marine Cave and the ability to catch Kyogre. The Fossil Maniac has dug deeper into the cave and uncovered the Desert Underpass, where you can find Wild Ditto, which are incredibly useful for breeding Pokémon, and the fossil you didn't choose before. There's also an optional battle with Steven in a new room in Meteor Falls. He's the strongest trainer in the game, about on par with Red, with a team to rival his. Steven was the champion of Ruby and Sapphire, and the decision to replace him is disappointing, but the optional battle makes up for it, with the same formidable team he used in those games. Steven has also left us a Beldum as a gift should you return to his house in Moss Deep City. That's about it for exploration on the mainland. There's only a few more things we can do here. Gym leaders will occasionally be able to be rematched random like any other trainer in the region. Trainer Hill is now open, and we're about ready to tackle Pokemon contests. Pokemon contests are a huge side activity and an alternate take on traditional Pokemon battles. Each move also has contest stats assigned to it and a condition associated with it. Beauty, cool, cute, smart, and tough. To compete, you have to assemble an optimal contest moveset and use berries you find throughout the region in the Berry Blender minigame, which lets you create Pokeblocks to increase your Pokémon's contest stats. Pokémon can only eat so many Pokeblocks, making it necessary to use the best berries possible with the highest amount of people in order to optimize your stats. In fact, the only way to make Feebas evolve is to maximize its beauty stat. It's the only Pokémon to evolve in such a way. Contests are divided into four ranks, Normal, Super, Hyper, and Master, but they all play out in the same way, with the only difference being how difficult the AI opponents are to defeat. The first round is the Appearance Round, where you get points solely based on how high your Pokémon's contest stat is. And the second is a pseudo-battle format where you have five rounds to appeal to the judge and the audience through moves. Moves can do many things, such as randomize the appeal order or protect your Pokémon from getting started by other moves and some can be used in combination with others to get a better result on a future turn. Like regular battles, there's a surprising amount of depth underneath the surface. Not as much, but still enough to make this an interesting side mode with some competitive appeal. Victory earns your Pokémon a ribbon, a symbol of its triumph that will stay with that Pokémon through the rest of the series, even when transferred to later games. Trainer Hill is a unique side area that only appeared in Generation 3. Your task with ascending four floors as fast as possible, each containing a short puzzle and a set of trainers to battle. The Pokémon here match the level of yours, so victory depends more on actual strategy. Since the trainers here are the same every time, you would assemble teams designed to optimally handle your opponent's teams to bring down your time and get better prizes at the top. It's a really unique concept, and I'm not sure why it was never revisited past this point. Last but not least is the Battle Frontier. It's a large island with seven different battle facilities, where the goal is to defeat the frontier brands in each to win their symbols. There's a silver symbol for the first time you encounter one, and a gold one for the second. You're rewarded battle points for every victory, which you can use to purchase items and use move tutors to help you reach even further into the challenges and give you an edge in PvP. The battle tower is nearly the same as in Crystal, seven battles in a row with standard PvP rules. The Battle Dome uses a tournament-style format where you can look ahead at what Pokémon your opponents are going to use. The Battle Palace is completely automated. Dictated by their nature, your Pokémon will use moves on their own and you have little influence over the outcome. The Battle Arena hosts matches with a time limit of three turns. Fail to knock out your opponent in the time limit and a judge will decide the victor. The Battle Factory is a fan favorite. You're given a selection of rental Pokémon to use and have to make a team based on your limited options, with the opportunity to trade for an opponent's Pokémon after you win. The Battle Peg is luck-based. Pick one of three doors and see what lies ahead, aiming to get through seven rooms without guaranteed healing in between. 
The Battle Pyramid focuses on exploration, throwing you into a dark room and tasking you to get through seven floors of the maze, all the while being attacked by wild Pokémon and random trainers. Each facility puts a unique spin on traditional battles, but some are better than others. The Battle Palace is dreadfully luck-based since it's entirely out of your control and the Battle Pike isn't much better. The Battle Dome is also somewhat dull in comparison to the others. The unique challenges presented by the others, though, make up for it, and you're sure to be able to spend hours here crafting the perfect team to make your way to the top of each facility. The Battle Frontier is fondly remembered for a very good reason. And with that, I've covered all that Pokémon Emerald has to offer. So what do I think overall? Emerald is fantastic overall. Hoenn is a very memorable region with plenty to see him do both before and after you finish the game. And it cannot be understated how important some of the core changes are despite how minor they might seem. It's very balanced in terms of difficulty, and Pokémon variety is pretty good overall. This is where the games start putting an emphasis on their stories, and Emerald really falls flat here. The goals of both teams aren't well thought out, and they both end up feeling like a nuisance rather than a real threat. The real downfall of Emerald, and why some people still dislike it to this day, is its lack of compatibility with the older games. Although a necessity and a good move to make while the franchise was still young, it's understandable that this would frustrate people who loved the first two generations. If you're one of those people, I encourage you to give Gen 3 another shot. You might just find something to love here. If I were to rank it, I would put Emerald slightly above Crystal. Crystal's region is larger, but Emerald is more content-dense with a better level curve and more Pokémon variety. Next time, we're looking at another device of entry in the last true definitive version. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate it if you could leave a like and or comment down below. And if you want to see more of these long-form analysis videos in the future, please consider subscribing. Until next time, I'm Forma, and those are my thoughts.